Nissan's fourth generation X-Trail evolves into a more polished contender in the segment for family sized SUVs offering up to seven seats. The cabin is nicer, the looks are sharper, and you can have efficient e-power semi-electric petrol propulsion beneath the bonnet. Time to take this contender more seriously. Lots of brands claim to offer the world's best-selling SUV, and Nissan is one of them. The company's X-Trail angling for that title, and now in its fourth generation. It's certainly a very successful nameplate for the brand. Over two decades, almost seven million X-Trails have been sold globally. And if you include the US market, where this car is branded as the Rogue, over three quarters of a million X-Trails find new owners globally every year. An awful lot of family buyers, it seems, like the idea of a mid-sized Qashqai class crossover, but need one with a little more space and the option of a third seating row. Seven seat functionality hasn't always been an X-Trail trait. Earlier first and second generation versions of this model line, launched respectively in 2000 and 2007, didn't offer it, but sales took off when the third generation T32 series version was introduced in 2013 with the option of three seating rows. Now that model was updated in 2017 and it kick-started demand for mid-sized SUVs that could seat seven. Rival SUVs like Peugeot's 5008 and three Volkswagen Group designs, the Skoda Kodiak, the Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace and the Seat Taraco quickly provided attractive class alternatives. Hence the need for this fourth generation T33 series X-Trail, announced early in 2021 but not on sale here until autumn 2022. Now, this was the X-Trail that was supposed to be built in Britain under a deal done by Nissan CEO Carlos Gozen with Downing Street back in 2016. But that was before Brexit and Gozen's subsequent disgrace and departure. So unlike its closely related Sunderland-made Qashqai showroom stablemate, this T33 era design ended up being built in Japan. And quite a different design it is, the range now devoid of diesels and primarily powered instead by the company's clever e-power series hybrid power plant that styles this model somewhat confusingly as a petrol powered electric car. Will it work for your family? You'll need the industry's most comprehensive review, the car and driving road test, to find out. In its e-power form, this fourth generation X-Trail isn't an EV, but it feels like it when you uh, take a seat behind the wheel and push the black starter button on the fascia. You note the dashboard's EV and e-pedal brake regeneration buttons. There's the usual weird looking EV-like gear selector and the virtual dials in front of you spin into place to reveal a power meter. Plus, there's no grumbly engine sound from beneath the bonnet. Uh, what's in store here? Let's find out. Not everything can be served up in the current EV revolution. Take big family SUVs with seven seats that you won't need a lottery win to own. At the time of this test in mid-2023, the closest you could get to something like that was this car. Nissan's X-Trail in e-power form. It isn't an EV, you still put petrol in it and you can't plug it in, but on the other hand the engine never actually drives the wheels, providing energy instead so that electricity can do the job, continually recharging the system battery as it goes. Hence Nissan's claim that this is a battery car with a 460 mile range and five minute recharging. Confusing, isn't it? Or at least it will be to the legions of previous X-Trail owners whose only exposure to this model line has been via a conventional rumbly diesel, the kind of power plant that these days Nissan only fits to its vans. The closest this fourth generation X-Trail gets to conventionality beneath the bonnet is with an entry-level 12-valve 
mild hybrid 1.5 litre petrol unit borrowed from the Qashqai and only available with front wheel drive and Xtronic auto transmission. This has a base output of 163 PS, makes 62 miles an hour in 9.6 seconds on the way to 124 miles an hour and is a power plant the brand expects most potential owners to completely ignore. So our focus here must match Nissan's and concentrate on the e-power drivetrain that we're testing today, a setup we've already tried in the Qashqai. Though with the X-Trail you're not limited to a front-driven format. It's actually an E-Force four-wheel drive model we're trying for this film. Otherwise though, most of the engineering in play here is very similar to that which you get with a Qashqai, including the CMFC platform that also underpins Alliance partner Renault's similarly priced Austral SUV. That car could also have used the e-power system, but features its own, more efficient, self-charging full hybrid unit instead. You might wonder why you should believe Nissan's claims for this e-power technology when its own alliance partner can't see the benefit of it. A fair question. But the e-power system certainly seems to add up to a rather interesting proposition on paper. As we've said, unlike quite a few segment rivals, you can't plug in any version of the X-Trail. In another difference of opinion with partner brand Renault, Nissan apparently doesn't believe in PHEVs. So instead, what we've got here is basically a series hybrid, a bit like one of the proper kind that can run for at least part of the time on battery power alone. But there are key differences. The e-power drivetrain's 1.97 kilowatt battery is about twice the size it would usually be on a full hybrid. And unlike in one of those, the engine, a little three-cylinder variable compression 1.5 litre turbo petrol unit, isn't transmission linked and, as we said earlier, never directly powers the wheels. Instead, it generates electricity, which then provides power to an inverter. Where that power goes and how much of it there is depends on the kind of X-Trail e-power model that you've chosen. The two-wheel drive version has a single front axle mounted electric motor which puts out 204 PS, 330 Newton meters of torque, a little more than the equivalent Qashqai so as to allow for this X-Trail's porkier curb weight. Enough to propel the car to 62 miles an hour in 8 seconds, though to go with the EV-like vibe top speed is considerably limited, in this case to 105 miles an hour. The alternative is the X-Trail e-Power e-Force model that we're trying here, which gains an additional 136 PS electric motor on the rear axle. Because the battery can't fully supply both motors at once, the combined system total output is pegged at 213 PS, but that's still enough to supply 525 newton meters of torque and get you to 62 miles an hour in seven seconds, en route to 111 miles an hour. It's also enough, incidentally, to overcome the rather pathetic 670 kilogram brake towing capacity figure that applies to the front-driven X-Trail e-Power model, though the all-wheel drive version's 1.8 tonne towing weight is still beaten by the two tonne figure of the conventional mild hybrid variant. The Japanese brand is rather proud of this E-Force layout, referring to it as the spiritual offspring of the clever Atessa ETS torque split system used in their late great GTR supercar. Technology the brand has combined with the traction of the intelligent 4x4 setup used in their old patrol go anywhere large SUV. It constantly manages and redistributes torque and braking power between all four wheels so that the driver's intended line is faithfully followed, even on really slippery surfaces. If they don't happen to be at hand and you're test driving back to back with a front-driven X-Trail e-Power, you won't feel a night and day difference with this e-Force version on a trip around the block, but you'll be thankful for it in winter, a season for which an extra snow driving mode is provided for this all-wheel drive variant. The extra grip this will give in Arctic conditions will be very well worth having. The system's apparently able to respond to grip changes by altering front to rear torque distribution in less than a thousandth of a second. 
Whatever kind of Xtrail e-power model you decide upon, it will of course only work with auto transmission, but does so more smoothly than the CVT autos used in some full hybrids, thanks to a feature called Linear Tune, which is supposed to tie engine revolutions to road speed. For sure, you don't get the furious revving and mooing that tends to accompany press-on progress with most more conventional self-charging hybrids. But even here, with heavy applications of your right foot, uh, the needle on the power meter ahead of you whirls around like a windmill, totally out of sync with the speedometer alongside, as the drivetrain works out precisely how it's supposed to propel the car forward. Nissan has also engineered in its e-pedal tech, which on application of this little button between the seats increases energy regeneration when you come off the throttle, arresting things noticeably and useful if you're pushing on for scrubbing speed at corner entry. This doesn't slow the car as much as it would with the company's Leaf and Aria full EVs, but if you choose to use it in concert with the gear selectors provided B setting, it will mean that in normal motoring you'll be using the brake pedal a lot less. An EV button sits alongside the e-pedal switch, supposedly for full EV driving, but it only deigns to activate if you're driving like Miss Marple at speeds, which would barely allow you to overtake a bicycle. Nissan says the car will go between one and two miles on battery power alone, but we've never got anywhere close to that and have never heard of anyone who has. But that's okay, hybrids aren't supposed to be EVs, the idea instead being that the battery should cut in and out on urban trips as often as possible, as is the point here, though we couldn't help feeling that a lot of the time the so-called VC turbo engine was being called into action to power the motor rather more often than we would have liked for maximum frugality. At least it eases in and out pretty seamlessly. There are no steering wheel paddles like you get with an ordinary mild hybrid automatic X-Trail, but you do get the same selection of D-mode drive settings selectable via this little rotary dial near the gear selector. Standard is the default one and there's Eco if you're feeling virtuous, but predictably, to make this Nissan feel in any way eager, you have to leave it in Sport. Select that and if you're running late on your favoured twisting secondary school run route, you might be pleased to find that this particular X-Trail isn't a complete duffer when it comes to a series of twisting secondaries at speed, though your passengers won't thank you for putting that attribute to the test without a very good reason. The steering's not been too anaesthetised, cornering traction particularly in this E-Force model, is reassuring and you can string a series of faster turns together surprisingly neatly, though a rival Seat Turaco still feels sharper. Ride quality is an exemplary over potholes and poor services and gets worse if you choose a top variant with the largest 20 inch wheel size, but higher speed undulations are coped with better, making this a comfortable family cruiser, particularly in this E-Force form, which pairs its extra rear motor with a high-tech brake vectoring and brake regeneration setup, which is supposed to deliver a more stable ride. Avoid stressing the little engine, keeping it in its sweet spot, and you'll find that refinement's excellent too. If you've stretched to a top Techno model like this one, your X-Trail will come with Nissan's improved suite of Pro Pilot Drive Assist features, which gives you active lane following, automatic speed limit adjustment, and what Nissan calls NaviLink, which uses GPS data to automatically slow the car for bends. Earlier we touched upon the e system's capabilities. Nissan's keen to point out that they also make this fourth generation X-Trail just as capable as its more conventionally engineered four-wheel drive predecessors off-road. Clever traction control and an off-road mode, as well as the snow setting that we mentioned earlier, combine to allow you to keep going even when a wheel or two is dangling in mid-air. The car won't tip over on a 30 degree tilt and hill descent control will ease you down slippery slopes. Ultimately though, any really gnarly off-road adventures are going to be limited by the tarmac orientated tyres and the rather feeble ground clearance. 
Still, the commanding driving position makes you feel like jungle excursions might be possible, and for most buyers that'll be all that really matters. What they're choosing here is a kind of SUV, a kind of electric vehicle, and a kind of do-it-all family five-door, which kind of makes an awful lot of sense. There's been a bit of a styling switch with this fourth generation X-Trail. Its predecessor merely visually resembled a supersized version of the brand's smaller Qashqai SUV, partly because it also had to replace a previously offered seven-seat uh, plus two version of that model. Despite a range of familiar brand styling cues, this Mark IV T33 era X-Trail in contrast is very much its own car and much more chunky SUV than stylized urban jungle crossover. This is particularly evident from this squirrel side profile, which Nissan has tried to smarten with a rear C-pillar it claims to have shaped to resemble a dolphin fin. Roof rails and a contrast coloured roof get fitted to plusher models. Muscular black clad wheel arches house rims are between 18 and 20 inches in size. We've got 19 inches here. And the prominently raised chrome embellished lower trim panel is supposed, in Nissan's words, to bring a sense of fluidity to the sheer surfaces of the doors. The boxy shape with its floating style roof is also surprisingly aerodynamic, thanks, Nissan says, to underbody covers that manage airflow beneath the vehicle and a unique air curtain that is supposed to precisely direct airflow from the front to the sides of the car. The front end certainly makes a statement that's anything but shy and retiring. The usual signature V-motion Nissan grille is flanked by a two-tier light structure the lower part on each side made up of LED headlights that appear moulded within the bodywork of the front bumper. These upper combined daytime running light and indicator strips nestle against the shut line of the bonnet. What Nissan calls 3D tyre deflectors feature in the lower front fascia just above a silvered lower skid plate. At the rear, taut horizontal lines sit just above and below the number plate mounting while split rear lights ensure a wide aperture for the tailgate. The silver panel curves under the rear bumper aiming to emphasise this car's intended adventurous character. As usual though, what's more important here is what you can't see. This rear hatch is now fashioned from a lighter composite material and all the doors, the front wings and the bonnet are now made from aluminium. As with the smaller Qashqai, the whole structure sits on the Renault-Nissan-Mitsubishi Alliance's latest CMFC platform. So, quite a departure from the more familiar Qashqai outside. Will the same be true in the cabin? Let's see. We're promised a segment standard setting premium interior ambience here, but the truth is that it's really just a Qashqai with a more commanding driving position and a differently designed center console. Fortunately, there's nothing really wrong with that, thanks to the step forward in quality the Qashqai has taken in its current third generation J12 series form. As modern interiors tend to be, this one's dominated by infotainment monitors, or at least it will be if you get your X-Trail specified in one of its plusher forms. Do that and the premium pretensions even start to make some sort of sense. White background lighting, a glass roof and the largest head-up display in the segment feature near the top of the lineup, along with this test card's faux leather dash and door stitching and grain blackwood trim. Plus, the silver beading and textured plastic surfaces are smart, while the quilted leather upholstery offered at the very summit of the range really does look very nice indeed. True, there's still nothing here that'll scare Audi or Mercedes, but there's no doubt that the cabin ambience has taken a welcome step up market. We mentioned changes to the centre console, which features one of those so-called floating layouts, the top level of which here gives you the car's e-shifter gear selector, the drive mode selection dial and twin cup holders, as well as a 15 watt wireless phone charger, one of the biggest we've ever seen. 
The lower tier of the floating console is for storage, and though there's not as much of it as you get with similar arrangements on full EVs, you'll be able to fit in items like a wallet or a tablet. The brand talks of the fanatical attention to detail that's gone into creating what seems like quite a familiar environment. Perhaps it's all the more impressive that you don't really notice it. Take, for instance, the fact that the centre screen isn't just operated by touch and voice. The fascia also has proper physical shortcut buttons for it. The result is a user-friendly cabin that feels easy to get to grips with pretty quickly. Switch from some rivals and you'll also be pleased to find that the brand hasn't been tempted to build climate functions into this central monitor where they'd be fiddly to find. They're more clearly accessible on this lower centre stack panel which now includes the heated seat controls which you had to hunt around for on the previous model. A previous owner would notice that visibility is improved. That's because of the wider opening angle of the windscreen and the narrower A-pillars. And a new convert might notice that you can more easily turn the high beam assist on and off with this button at the end of the left indicator stalk. Or that the USB ports provided at the base of the centre stack are of both the USB-A and USB-C variety, so you don't have to faff around with converter leads. All small touches, certainly, but collectively very important. As is this Mark IV model step forward in infotainment and connectivity. Well, on the nicer variants anyway. With entry-level trim, you don't even get a centre screen. And analogue dials separated by a 7-inch combi meter display are the norm unless you stretch at least to mid-level N connector spec. As long as you spend plumply on your X-Trail though, your view through the chunky three-spoke leather stitch steering wheel will be dominated by this much more informative 12.3 inch TFT combi meter instrument display and it is worth stretching to. A traditional Creco cut glass texture has been added to the TFT screen's digital background, apparently a nod to this model's Japanese DNA. And as usual with virtual instrument tech, you get two computer generated dials separated by a customizable centre section for safety, drive assist and traffic sign features. Plus, in this case, the layout can also be tweaked into a funky rotated view. The right-hand speedometer gauge, which only shows in even-numbered increments, has a lower fuel meter. The left-hand gauge will be a rev counter in the mild hybrid version, or, as here, a power meter in e-power variants, complete with a battery charge readout at its base. Provided you've avoided entry-level trim, anything else you need to know can be found on the car's centre screen, which is 8.2 inches in size with a centre premium trim that gains this 12.3-inch Nissan Connect display from N connector spec upwards. Like everything else in this cabin, this monitor's functionality is super straightforward. We talked about these lower shortcut switches, and there's a further row of virtual buttons for navigation, music, phone, and media functions on the screen's right-hand edge. From its home starting point, where the display will usually be split into widget sections for phone, audio, and Google navigation, you can then swipe left or right to get access to an analog clock and Nissan's suite of connected services, which are quite sophisticated, compatible with Google Assistant and Amazon Alexa devices. This screen also includes a TomTom live traffic service and Wi-Fi activation for up to seven devices at once. Plus, the Apple CarPlay smartphone mirroring at this level in the range is of the wireless sort, and Techno-spec models like this one get a strong-sounding premium Bose audio system. What else? Well, that raised driving position offers a good range of adjustment, both in the height-adjustable Qashqai-derived seat, which also offers good support, and the great-to-hold reach and rake steering wheel. There's lumbar support for the driver, too. The broad windscreen gives better forward vision this time round. Unfortunately, your over-the-shoulder view isn't quite as good, restricted a little by the thick rear pillars. But rear parking sensors and blind spot monitoring are standard on all models. And on all but entry-level trim, you get a rear camera too, with an excellent multi-camera around view monitor setup, standard from mid-range N connector trim upwards. In line with its family-orientated role, the X-Trail needs to provide a practical cabin. Does it? Well, you decide. The door pockets aren't that big, the glove box turns out to be smaller than it looks, compromised by a fuse box, and there are no useful touches like footwell storage or under-seat trays. 
We talked earlier about the stowage beneath this center console and the two USB ports near this wireless charging mat at the base of the center stack. There's a 12 volt socket here too. This butterfly lidded box between the seats is nice to have but has no connectivity ports inside. Just a recessed area and a cheap bit of lower felt that isn't stuck down and doesn't cover the base of the receptacle. It's nice though that you get an overhead sunglasses compartment even when this glass roof is fitted. And the basics are covered off reasonably well so you get nice deep cup holders between the front seats and ticket clips in the sun visors. Let's move to the second row. The rear door opens widely to 90 degrees for easy access and at first glance the cabin looks as spacious as the statistics promise. Once inside, you'll find that the extra 40 millimeters of length between the wheels that this car enjoys over its Qashqai stablemate enables it to offer very reasonable standards of legroom, something further aided by these sculpted front seat backs, but most notably by a bench that can slide backwards or forwards over a 260 millimeter range, giving between 610 and 820 millimeters of leg space, depending on the position. The backrests recline too. Nissan has raised the seats up so as to give you a good view forward, but compromised headroom a little as a result, particularly on models fitted with the panoramic glass roof that comes fitted further up the range. The center transmission tunnel is pleasingly low, and as a result, you could fit three adults abreast in this second row if you really had to. It's just a pity that the seat cushioning is rather flat and shapeless. Plusher versions get USB-A and USB-C charging points, dedicated climate controls and sun blinds integrated into the rear doors. On all variants there are big door bins, seat back pockets, an overhead reading light on each side and coat hooks in the grab handles. There's no centre armrest but if there are only two of you back here and you have a plusher model fitted with the more flexible 40-20-40 split backrest, as in this case, you can pull on this little strap and pull the centre part of the uh, backrest forward, at which point a couple of cup holders and a pen tray are revealed. As before, there's a choice of either five or seven seat versions of this model. Nissan expects that most likely owners will want their X-Trail fitted out with the third seating row we have here. Now, if you've chosen that, then in theory, the process for gaining access to the very back of the car isn't too complicated. There's a catch, on the seat shoulder uh, to activate it, but that mechanism only works if the front seat is far enough forward to be out of the way of the mechanism tumbling forward, which with most regularly sized front seat occupants it won't be, so you'll usually have to push the front seat forward before you can start to even think about third row entry. Even then, the entry aperture revealed is very small indeed, and access will require a degree of athleticism which might be beyond granny if you're thinking of confining her there on your Sunday afternoon trip out to the garden centre. Perhaps it's best all round not to even think of confining her back here in the first place. As with most SUVs in this class these extra pews are really only intended for children or medium-sized adults on short journeys. Nissan says that they're suitable for occupants up to 160 centimetres in height, think around 5 foot 2 inches. The leg space on offer is about the same as you get in the third row of rivals like Volkswagen's Tiguan Allspace or Seat's Turaco. In other words, there's very little indeed and the high floor means that your knees are raised up towards chest level. A Hyundai Santa Fe or Kia Sorento would give you a little more room back here, but would cost you quite a lot more too. As with those cars, you certainly shouldn't make the mistake of thinking of this X-Trail as being directly comparable to the kind of large van-based MPV that you could get yourself for much the same sort of money. But then, no family-sized SUV model of this sort ever is. A few things help the X-Trail's cause here though. First, the theatre-style raised seating layout that gives passengers a better view of the road ahead and will make them feel a little better about their confined quarters. Second, it's easier than it often is with third row seating to slide your feet 
beneath the seat base ahead. And thirdly, the fact that because, as we've already mentioned, the second row seats have sliding bases and adjustable backrests, you can prevail upon folks seated ahead to help you out. In theory, increasing leg space to as much as 660 millimeters. Finally, let's check out the boot. The composite tailgate is electrically operable in plusher variants like this one and can now be raised with a wave of your foot beneath the bumper. If key and pocket, you're approaching your X-Trail laden down with bags. And once it's up, well, if as here you've got a seven-seater model and have all the chairs in place, capacity is predictably restricted to just 117 litres. That's 18 litres less than with the previous generation model. You can at least make the third row backrests a little more upright if you're cramming stuff in behind them. The loading deck level is high off the ground and as usual with a seven-seat SUV, there's nowhere to store any sort of spare wheel. You get a light and a 12 volt socket on the right, but no bag hooks or tie downs. And of course, there's no room for the useful twin cargo board system that you get in pricier versions of the Qashqai ePower. Not in this seven seat model anyway. This single cargo board remains for plusher X trails, but disappointingly, there's no wipe clean surface on the reverse of it. Underneath, there's no room for anything but a can of sealant and items you might recently have run over. Most of the time, of course, you're going to have these extra pews folded into the floor. An easy process accomplished by pulling on these long black straps. Now, on this seven-seat model, that releases up to 485 litres of cargo space, 20 litres more than the previous generation model. If you've opted for a five-seat only variant, so you don't have to mess about retracting third-row seating, you'll lift the tailgate to be faced with a 575 litre boot with the e-power models or 585 litres with the base mild hybrid variant. Whichever version you've opted for, Nissan claims a best in class floor length and width between wheelhouses. Like the third row seat backs, those in the second row can be made a little more upright, which might be helpful uh, in squeezing in suitcases, say on an airport run. If you've longer items to carry, like skis, which it might be useful to push forward in between a couple of second row occupants, don't take it for granted that your chosen X trail will come with this flexible 40-20-40 split second row seat back that'll enable you to do that. Rather meanly, Nissan restricts this arrangement to the two priciest Techna trim levels. Otherwise, you're stuck with a conventional 60-40 seat back split. The process for folding all the seats flat isn't quite as easy as it could and should be. You have to go round to the side door and pull a strap at the base of the seat. You'll need to study the x price and spec list quite carefully before making up your mind on variant because unlike this plush test car, Lower order variants are quite heavily decontented in terms of equipment. And there's also quite a price span across the range, 33,000 to 50,000 pounds at the time of filming in summer 2023. It's a petrol powered only lineup. There's no PHEV option. You have to have automatic transmission. And with all the trim levels, there's a choice of either five or seven seat cabin layouts. The latter requiring an extra 1,000 pounds. A conventional 2.5 litre petrol engine is available in other markets, but we won't get that here. Things kick off with entry level Vizier spec, but you probably won't want that. Not only because the kit list is relatively meagre, but also because this trim level comes only with the brand's most conventional mild hybrid engine. Nissan calls it the VC Turbo. A 163 PS front driven only powertrain the company thinks will account for a minority of sales. The ePower variants the company thinks most customers will want were, as we filmed, priced from around £37,000 and spread across the remaining four trim levels. A centre premium, N connector, that's the biggest seller, and then finally the two range topping options, Tecna, which is what we have here, and Tecna Plus. Across these spec options, if you're looking at five seats, you'll have the choice of all three available powertrains. At prices, that'll see you needing to find just under three and a half thousand pounds more than you'd pay for the brand's smaller cash car model. 
If the mild hybrid engine is your X-Trail starting point, you'll need around 1,500 pounds more to move to the front-driven 204 PS e-power unit, or around 4,500 pounds more on top of the mild hybrid model price to move to the e-power e-force four-wheel drive version that we're trying here. If you're looking at an X-Trail with seven seats, like the one we have in this case, you only get the choice of either the mild hybrid or, with a big price jump, this E-Force E-Power version. This Technotrimmed E-Power E-Force seven-seat variant listed at about £46,500 at the time of filming. So, what kind of value proposition does all that pricing represent in segment? Well, obviously, the rivals you'll need to consider will vary depending on the number of seating rows you require in your X-Trail. For simplicity here, we'll base our comparisons on the seven-seat version that we're trying today. Its most obvious competitor is the Volkswagen Group design created as either a Seat Taraco, a Skoda Kodiak, or a Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace. If you're looking at a mild hybrid X-Trail, you'll be comparing against these three models in their base 1.5-litre 150 PS Eco TSI petrol form. And if you do that, you'll find that the Taraco's price similarly a Kodiak costs around £2,000 more, and a Tiguan Allspace costs around £3,000 more. If you want your X-Trail with seven seats, it's hard to find a direct rival for the front-driven e-power version. The comparably priced and powered Taraco, Kodiak and Tiguan Allspace alternatives use a two-litre diesel engine. If you're looking at this X-Trail in this e-power E4 seven-seat form, then the closest match that Volkswagen Group Design can offer is a much thirstier, conventional 2.0-litre TSI petrol engine with 190 PS mated to four-wheel drive. And that kind of powertrain would cost you around £2,500 more in a Kodiak and around £5,000 more in a Tiguan Allspace. We'd also want to consider a slightly larger model in this segment, the high-end Santa Fe, which in comparable 1.6-litre petrol turbo self-charging full hybrid form costs from around £43,000 at the time of this test. The only other class alternatives, also self-charging full hybrids, cost a lot more than even the priciest X-Trail, the Toyota Highlander and the Kia Sorento, both in this form pitched, as we filmed, from around £57,000. If, having considered all of this, you conclude that it is an X-Trail that you really want, then you're going to need to know just how generous Nissan has been with the standard spec. So, let's take a look at that now. We mentioned earlier that base Vizier spec might not be exactly what you might be looking for, but it does include automatic LED headlights with high beam assist, LED tail lamps, rear parking sensors, a sharp fin antenna, power folding mirrors, a Thatcham alarm system, and a very complete portfolio of safety kit, uh, which we'll brief you on in a few moments. Standard drive stuff across the range includes a selection of drive modes and intelligent cruise control, which keeps a safe distance from the vehicle in front and works with a standard traffic sign recognition system that links into a speed limiter, which when set could prevent you from exceeding the speed limit. Also built into this fourth generation model is an active brake limited slip system, basically one of those torque vectoring setups that senses wheel spin, then automatically applies the brakes to the spinning wheel and directs power to the wheel or wheels with the best traction. The base Vizier trim level includes 18 inch diamond cut alloy wheels, a seven inch combi meter display in the instrument binnacle, manual air conditioning, and a one-piece luggage board for the boot. The next trim level up, a center premium, builds on that with a reversing camera, iKey keyless entry, dual zone air conditioning, an auto dimming rear view mirror, and touch sensor door handles. Plus, in place of the rather basic audio and infotainment arrangement of the lead-in model, a center premium variants get an eight inch a IVI Display Audio 8 infotainment screen with wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, plus a six-speaker audio setup. Mid-range and connector spec models are marked out by roof rails and privacy glass, plus there's Nissan's around view monitor camera system with moving object detection, and a luggage board system for the five-seat version. 
or importantly, you'll need to stretch to this level in the range for the proper Mark IV X-Trail screen fest, including the larger 12.3 inch TFT combi meter display for the instrument binnacle. MediaTek takes a big step forward uh, from end connector trim upwards, thanks to the installation of the brand's 12.3 inch Nissan Connect display with connected services screen for the center stack. This connects you from home to car with Google Assistant and Amazon Alexa devices and includes wireless connection for Apple CarPlay and a 3D maps and live traffic navigation system with over-the-air updates, real-time traffic condition reports, Google Street View and info on local fuel prices. There's also a Nissan Connect Services app that allows you to remotely open the doors, preset the climate system, activate horn and lights, and get guided to your car if you've forgotten where you parked it. If you lend your X-Trail out, the app can alert you if it's driven outside a preset geographic boundary or if it's driven after a certain time. Plus, you can keep track of your journeys, check tire pressure, oil level, or airbag status, and conduct a vehicle health check at any time. Door-to-door -door navigation is provided too, so you can park up in a city and continue to get nav instructions as you complete your journey on foot. Bear in mind though that the app with all these functions is only provided free for the first three years of ownership. Technotrim, which as mentioned earlier is what we have here, is where things start feeling plusher and a lot more sophisticated. Here you gain 19 inch diamond cut alloy wheels, an openable glass roof and a hands-free power tailgate. Plus the headlights feature an adaptive driving beam which can split the high beam into 12 individually controlled segments to give better illumination without dazzling others. There's also front LED sequential turning signals, a heated windscreen and side parking sensors. The inside will look different too with Technospec thanks to the addition of ambient lighting and a 10.8 inch head up display. The seats take an upgrade thanks to leather and cloth upholstery in black or light grey, plus eight-way power adjustment for the front chairs, which also gain memory settings and nearby soft PVC knee pads. There's also heat for the steering wheel, the front seats and the rear seats. Plus you get a wireless charging mat, a 40-20-40 split second row seat back, rear door sunshades and three zone air conditioning, which adds second row climate controls. Another advantage to stretching up to Techna trim is that your X-Trail will come with Nissan's clever ProPilot Assist with NaviLink system. This can accelerate and brake the car within a single lane on the highway, if necessary stopping the car then automatically starting it again in heavy traffic. This updated system can also adapt to speed limits and using navigation data to road topography. So for instance, it will automatically slow the car as you enter the curve of a motorway slip road. The system will also apply corrective steering lock to prevent dangerous lane changes and stop the car if you're about to hit something at parking speeds. At the top of the trim tree is Techna Plus, which gains 20 inch diamond cut alloy wheels quilted premium leather seats in black or tan finishes and an uprated premium Bose sound system with 10 speakers. What about options across the range? Well, as usual, most of the available colors cost extra. We've got champagne silver here. If you avoid the two base trim levels, you can pay extra for two-tone paint too, which gets you this contrast colored roof. With this Techna trim, you can add the premium Bose audio system and across the range, there are various practical accessories. Things like luxury floor mats, also offered in velour or rubber, a rear bumper protector, uh, side steps, illuminated kick plates, and a reversible trunk liner for the boot floor. You can also add roof crossbars, which in turn will allow you to add a bike carrier, a ski carrier, and a roof box. Plus, of course, you can add a tow bar. Let's finish with a look at safety. A decent level of camera safety kit shouldn't be optional on a car of this price these days, and thankfully it isn't here. Hence this model's full house five-star Euro NCAP rating. A blue button on the right-hand steering spoke brings up a useful camera safety graphic showing the lane departure warning, blind spot warning, 
blind spot intervention and intelligent forward collision warning systems, the latter reinforced by intelligent front emergency braking that can recognise pedestrians, cyclists and junctions. There's also driver attention alert, which looks for signs of drowsiness and prompts the driver with an alarm and a shimmy of the steering wheel. And as mentioned earlier, high beam assist to dip your headlights for you at night. With most other brands, you'd have to stretch to top trim or buy a pricey optional pack to get rear cross traffic alert, which warns you of approaching traffic when you're reversing out of a space. It's standard here. And on an X-Trail, this works with intelligent rear automatic braking, which applies the brakes if an object is detected while you're reversing a child or a dog in your driveway, for instance. It's annoying that other makers think features like this are a luxury. Other things of note include the addition this time round of a new central airbag to support the usual twin front side and curtain bags. And as usual on modern cars, there's an emergency and breakdown call e-call system, which alerts the emergency services with your GPS location should one of those bags go off. Plus, of course, you get the usual systems for braking, traction and stability control, along with hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions and tyre pressure monitoring. We mentioned traffic sign recognition earlier. Plus, as usual in the rear, there are two Isofix child seat anchorage points with top tether fastenings. That's in the second row. European crossover customers spend more than 70% of their time driving in urban and suburban environments, which is why this X-Trail e-Power allegedly spends more than half of the WLTP rated combined cycle with its engine switched off. Not bad for a car that does without the charging limitations of a conventional EV or plug-in model. So why is just about every other brand in the industry, including Nissan's alliance partner Renault, avoiding the use of this kind of powertrain? Is the logic behind it in any way flawed? On one side of the argument, uh, you have brands like Honda pointing out that there are some periods in a vehicle's operating cycle when the most efficient option is to have the engine, not the electric motors, driving the wheels, which is impossible with the e-power setup. Now Nissan, of course, thinks differently, claiming this drawback is outweighed by the system's benefits, though the fact that the e-power approach can't markedly improve on the efficiency stats of a conventional self-charging hybrid drivetrain formula that's been around for two decades suggests otherwise. In our driving section, we told you how the e-power system's electrified elements worked. Well, the combustion part of the setup's pretty clever too. Instead of using conventional connecting rods, the VC turbo variable compression engine's pistons are joined to the crankshaft via multi-link motor-driven devices, which vary the top and bottom dead center of the pistons. No, we don't understand exactly the technicalities either, but what we can appreciate is the end result, which allows the engine to adopt a high compression state when you want performance, or a low compression state when you're lifting off and you're trying to promote economy. The transition between differing compression ratios is seamless with no input required from the driver. Let's get to the figures. In front driven form, the Xtrail e-Power delivers up to 48.7 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and up to 132 grams per kilometre of CO2. That's about 10% worse than the equivalent Qashqai e-Power model. That's with the least expensive Ascenta Premium trim. With the bigger wheels fitted further up the range, the readings rise a little uh, to 45.6 miles to the gallon and 141 grams per kilometre with top Tecna Plus trim. Still, even that's pretty impressive for a 204 PS engine, and it looks even better if you compare the returns against those of the equivalent 12 volt mild hybrid model, which stores regenerative energy in a little lithium ion battery and uses it to run the car's systems when it's temporarily stopped, at a red traffic light, for instance. The mild hybrid engine X-Trail 
manages up to 39.8 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and 161 grams per kilometre in base trimmed five seat form or 39.2 miles to the gallon and 164 grams per kilometre with seven seats. That's about the norm for conventionally engine family SUVs in this class. The Skoda Kodiak 1.5 TSI 150 PS 7 seat model for instance manages up to 40.3 miles to the gallon and up to 159 grams per kilometre of CO2. The problem for Nissan comes when you start to want this e-power systems complexity rewarded in terms of a real efficiency advantage over conventional self-charging hybrid segment rivals. If you're looking at the five-seat front-driven e-power version of this model, you'll find that a conventional two-wheel drive petrol electric segment competitor of that sort, like say a base Toyota RAV4 or a Lexus NX, will comfortably beat this X-Trail's efficiency figures by about 5%. This X-Trail e-power e 4 seven-seat model's efficiency proposition is a little more difficult to judge because there are much fewer direct full hybrid competitors against which to compare it. The readings in question, up to 44.8 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle and up to 143 grams per kilometre of CO2, add about 5% to those figures with bigger wheel rims, are certainly better than you'd get from self-charging hybrid versions of competitors that you might be looking at, like say Toyota's Highlander, Kia Sorento and Hyundai Santa Fe. But not that much better considering that all three of the models just mentioned are more powerful and bigger with more space in their third seating rows. For comparison, a 251 PS Toyota Highlander manages 39.7 miles to the gallon and 160 grams per kilometre. At least the figures in this and quotes appear to be relatively realistic. In this test with this seven seat E-Power E-Force model, we've been getting around 40 miles to the gallon and a range of about 600 miles from the 55 litre fuel tank. To try and maximize the efficiency returns possible from all the E-Power versions of this car, Nissan provides the usual Eco Drive Mode setting and an extra B brake regenerative optimizing setting for the gearbox and has developed a one-pedal driving system called e-pedal step. The idea here is also to take the repetitive strain out of stop-start urban driving, where the driver is frequently moving their foot between the accelerator and the brake. E-pedal step allows drivers to accelerate and brake using only the accelerator. The system must first be activated by a switch on the center console, and once engaged, e-pedal step will break the X-Trail at 0.2 G, enough to illuminate the brake lights and reduce the velocity down to a creeping speed, though not to a complete stop. So you can monitor your attempts at frugality. The instrument screen's settings menu has a view history section that graphically shows your recent and average fuel returns. That also forms part of a useful EcoDrive report that displays in the instrument cluster when you power off at the end of each journey. This e-power model's tax advantages aren't quite as great as you'd hope and obviously are nothing like they would be with an EV. The 37% benefit in kind rating for a mild hybrid X-Trail isn't hugely improved upon by a front-driven e-power variant that's at 31 to 33% while the E-Force four-wheel drive version we're trying here is rated at between 33 and 35 percent. A proper EV would of course be treated very differently as a tax liability. Nissan's own Aria, for instance, is BIK rated at just 2 percent. Extra insurance starts at 21 to 24E for the mild hybrid models. The front-driven E-Power model is rated at 24E to 27E, and this E-Power E-Force variant rates at 29E to 31E. In terms of servicing, the standard intervals are every 12 months or 18,000 miles, and there are a number of deals that allow you to pay monthly to cover services over a two, three, or four year period. With Nissan's not faring brilliantly in previous reliability surveys, even if most problems have been minor, that's worth considering. 
Like other Nissans, this one is covered by a three year, 60,000 mile warranty. That's average by class standards, but shorter than the five year unlimited mileage warranty of the rival Hyundai Santa Fe hybrid. The seven year, 100,000 mile warranty of the Kia Sorento hybrid and the potential 10 year warranty you'd get with a Toyota Highlander or RAV4. You have to pay to extend the duration or distance covered by this Nissan's package. There's breakdown assistance included from new for the first three years you own the car and for a year following each service at a Nissan dealer. Depreciation rates are better than you might be expecting. Uh, independent experts reckon the X-Trail will hold on to around 54% of its value after a typical three year 36,000 mile ownership period. That's about the same as a comparable Skoda Kodiak, but quite a lot better than the 46% figure that you'd get from a comparable Peugeot 5008. We can see why this fourth generation X-Trail could be so successful for Nissan. It offers enough crossover cues to make you feel acceptably trendy, but also sufficient size and space to make owners also feel that they bought into something smartly sensible. Plus, of course, it's perfect for those who've considered a slightly smaller Qashqai class model or owned one, but now need something more practical. Of course, you can't have everything. This car doesn't drive with quite as much verve and flair as a smaller SUV, but we can't blame Nissan for that. How we should judge this model's EPA engine though, we're not sure. On one hand, it's a clever concept and has delivered diesel-like frugality for us during this test. On the other, the e-power approach seems a very complicated way of generating much the same efficiency already available in this segment from more straightforward full hybrids. It might be crucial though that if you're looking for a seven seater in this class, the X-Trail does that job at a more affordable price. What else? Well, the cabin is a big improvement, but only really with the pricier variants further up the range. In some respects, luggage space isn't quite as good as before, but surprisingly, off-road agility is slightly better. Low speed ride could be improved, but the Mark IV model is a nicer cruiser. It's a mixed bag. Overall, the changes made to this T33 Mark IV model, considerable though they are, haven't ultimately hugely changed its buying proposition, which means that as before, it remains a starting point for anyone buying in this segment. If that's you, and you're looking for an SUV of this kind, then X may very well mark the spot. Music